Hey there, it's Gary Parrish. Welcome back to the CBS Sports Eye on College Basketball podcast. Matt Norlander is here with me on this Wednesday night because uh, it's a sad day in the sport. Bob Knight, the legendary and complicated basketball coach, has died at the age of 83. Passed away at home in Bloomington, Indiana, surrounded by loved ones. As you likely know, Bob Knight uh, was the head coach of three different schools. Army from 1965 to 1971, Indiana from 71 to 2000, and Texas Tech from 2001 to 2008. His career spanned five decades. He made five Final Fours, won three national championships in 1976, 1981, 1987. His 76 Hoosiers went 32-0. and That's the last Division I men's basketball team to finish a season undefeated. Nobody disputes Bob Knight's coaching ability or his accomplishments or his brilliance. He's an all-time great, but his legacy is obviously complicated. Uh, He was accused of assaulting a police officer in Puerto Rico in 1979 while coaching USA Basketball. He made controversial comments about sexual assault, got into a physical altercation with an LSU fan. He threw a chair during a game against Purdue, pulled his team off the court in a game against the Soviet national team after he was ejected from that game. He brought a bullwhip to a press conference once in Swiped it toward a black player. He was suspended three games in 2000 after CNN aired a video of him choking a player, Neil Reed, in a 1997 practice. And then less than a year after that video was aired, he was fired at Indiana following a run-in with a student. Unfortunately, um, you cannot talk about Bob Knight's coaching brilliance without acknowledging his shortcomings. It's all part of the story. Norlander, you handled the obit for CBSSports.com, so I'm interested to get your thoughts on the passing of an incredible coach who lived, again, a complicated life and leaves a complicated legacy. Yeah, there's no doubt about that. In fact, um, you know, it's a lengthy obit. Uh, We'll put it in the description here on this podcast episode if you'd like to read it. Um, You mentioned things in your intro there, GP, that I didn't even detail all the way through um, because there's a lot there. I think you can make a, a strong case that Bob Knight is is the apex example of a human being who is two things at once, and that is greatness personified in terms of coaching acumen, and that has been the long-held opinion by thousands of people in the basketball world for decades, but also, um, understandably and rightfully so, uh, controversial for many, many things that he said and did over the years. Um, he, Bob Knight and the likes of uh, of his ilk will never exist again in coaching moving forward, and nor should they. Um, he forced college basketball to evolve with the way that he coached, but in the manner in which he conducted himself so often, it also forced the sport and um, and I would argue American sports to leave its outdated practices in a way that I think may have been accelerated because of how well publicized some of the misdeeds that Knight had. Um, we're certainly going to give Knight his credit for what he did and what he accomplished, but this is a polarizing figure. I mean, he is, and I have this line in my obituary, in the state of Indiana, he was a god and he knew it, and many people treated him that way from the early part of the 70s until now. And there are a lot of people that love Bob Knight and are grieving heavily over the loss of, to those people, the greatest coach that they've ever known. Um, for many other people, there are, they do not have any tolerance for the way that Bob Knight conducted himself over the years as the coach at Indiana for the things he said, for the things he did. Um, we live in an era now where, rightfully so, there is so much more attention paid to treating people and really the coach-player dynamic, the two-way street of respect that needs to be there with sensitivity to physical well-being, mental well-being, mental wellness, mental illness. These things did not exist in terms of being recognized. And this was, I was born in the early 80s, so um, I can't even speak from experience in the 70s. Um, But certainly they, 
pl- they do, it goes without saying. I mean, that, that stuff did not exist then the way that uh, we at least acknowledge it now. It existed then, but I'm talking about the recognition of that. Um, but you hear from coaches across the sport and people that live this profession that played it, his former players, the ones that chose to play with him and stick at Indiana. Um, they were there for him and backed him up and, and they were his guys. He had an absolute army behind him. And so as he passes away, he just turned 83 less than a week ago. Um, I think I'm most struck by, yeah, the enormity of Bob Knight's legacy because you will have people on both sides of this. Everyone, for the most part, you know, uh, lamenting his loss, but there's no doubt about it. For everyone that will dig their heels in and say there were so many qualities about Bob Knight as a coach that they would want for themselves, for their programs, for their children, there are people on the other side of this 180 all the way that say that is the guy, the exact reason why um, I, I, I don't like all of the tropes and stereotypes that can come with coaching because he emblemized uh, so many of the bad things that can come with power trips and, and that dynamic that existed for decades in American sports. It's um, difficult for some people, myself included, to, to balance these things and separate these things and talk about them uh, with nuance. Um, but I do try my best, you know, um, because with Bob Knight, I think both things can be true. He was an amazing basketball coach, a brilliant basketball mind. And like I said on CBS Sports HQ earlier, you could reasonably argue the greatest to ever do it, even though he doesn't have a resume necessarily to back that up. There are men who have made more Final Fours, won more national championships, won more games. But, and stop me if you disagree, I, I think you can argue nobody has ever, at the Division I men's basketball level, done more with less individual talent than Mob Knight did at Indiana. One bit of evidence to support that would be in his entire career that spanned five decades, he coached one future NBA All-Star, Isaiah Thomas. Mike Krzyzewski, for instance, had three NBA All-Stars in the 2021 game alone. Bob Knight coached one ever and still won three national championships. He's the last person to ever guide an all college team for the United States to an Olympic gold medal. He did it without a hint of rules violations. Nobody ever said, yeah, but you know how he's doing it in Bloomington. That just wasn't a thing attached to him. In fact, he took great pride in, you know, doing th- things, quote unquote, as it pertains to recruiting the right way and then beating coaches he knew who didn't. And so I think you can say all that with a straight face and be really um, a- a- appreciative of the coaching impact he's made on the sport and you know of the coaching tree that is attached to him um, that has you know big names in it, most notably, uh, Mike Krzyzewski, who, of course, played for him at Army. But then there's this other part of his story that overshadows so much of it. And that part of the story is tied to the reality that he was a bully. He was a, a mean person in in certain situations. He treated people terribly in certain situations. And so you've got to try to figure out how to juggle that. Can you can you say both of these things and hold both of these thoughts at the same time? That man there was one of the greatest basketball coaches who ever lived, basketball minds we've ever had, but he was also in many ways, uh, a, 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 in, in certain times, uh, a really despicable human. I, I struggle with this in modern times as long as we're just talking with Kanye West, I I don't know what to do with that. I I think he's a brilliant um, maker of music and he has made some of my favorite albums of all time. I like his shoes, but in other aspects of his life, I find him abhorrent and deplorable. How do you juggle the both of those things? How do you hold both of those thoughts? Um, That is the thing that people are trying to figure out tonight about Bob Knight. 
how do you celebrate his coaching greatness, uh, but do so without ignoring so many personal shortcomings that that ultimately derailed his career at Indiana. They did, and you know, I think for the purposes of of this show and and in the obituary that I wrote, and plenty of other places for people that are watching or listening that that have or will absorb. Uh, coverage of the passing of Bob Knight at 83 years old. Uh, it's important to to tell the whole story and the whole picture. Um, he was as self assured and strong held as in in his convictions as as really any coach. His story, and I think you know, he started out like his first brush with greatness came as a player. He won a national title at Ohio State in 1960. Played alongside. Hall of Famer, Sherry Lucas, John Havlicek. He got the head coaching job at Army three years removed from graduating college. And it was there that he met Krzyzewski. And those two have certainly a, an interesting and long and, and complicated history. The parts of their relationship cooled. Um, Krzyzewski beat India and, and Knight. They, they famously faced off in the Final Four in the early 90s. Krzyzewski did put out a statement earlier on Wednesday to, to no surprise whatsoever. In fact, as I understand this uh, for many years, it was Krzyzewski that was the one that was trying to uh, make amends and just make things better between him and his mentor. And uh, I think some parts of that did indeed get sewed up. But Krzyzewski said, quote, we lost one of the greatest coaches in the history of basketball today. Clearly, he was one of a kind. Coach Knight recruited me, mentored me and had prof a profound impact on my career and in my life. This is a tremendous loss for our sport, and our family is deeply saddened by his passing. We offer our sincerest condolences to Karen, Tim, Pat, and their families during this difficult time. End quote from Krzyzewski. Mike Woodson also, you know, we have so much to cover here, so I'm, I don't want to jump around too, too much, GP, but I want to at least hit on a couple of these, uh, a couple of these big quotes, because Mike Woodson, who is now coaching Indiana, a former Bob Knight player, Knight famously disassociated himself from Indiana for the way that he was fired and fired in a way that many people thought was justified. People thought he should have been fired previously. He was put on a zero tolerance policy by then athletic director, Miles Brand. And then it was a brush with a student um, who said, hey, you know, what's up, Knight? That that led to his ouster. Um, Woodson returning to the program. He had Knight had, had come back in 2020 and spoken at halftime and was recognized and honored and he moved back to Bloomington but it was this past season where Bob Knight you know quietly made his way over from his house in Bloomington to see Indiana practice I was told earlier on Wednesday he was there almost every week last season just to watch just to take it in and to watch his former player Mike Woodson guide guide that Indiana program here's what Mike Woodson had to say on Wednesday Quote, is, it is a profoundly sad day for all of us who loved Coach Knight. My thoughts and prayers go out to his wife, Karen, his family, and to all those who loved him. I am so blessed that he saw something in me as a basketball player. He influenced my life in ways I could never repay. As he did with all of his players, he always challenged me to get the most out of myself as a player and, more importantly, as a person. His record as a basketball coach speaks for itself. He will be remembered as one of the greatest ever, and his impact on the game of basketball is etched in stone. His teams were always prepared, and with him on the sideline, you always believe that he put you in the best position to win. I will always cherish the time we spent together after I played for him. His fierce loyalty to his former players never wavered. I am grateful that he was able to come to practices after I came back. His presence meant so much to me and my staff. I got one more quote for you, GP, and then we'll continue with the conversation. Roy Williams checking in on Wednesday night. Quote, Coach Dean Smith was certainly my mentor, but the next guy for me was Bob Knight. I played golf with him, watched baseball with him, watched his practices my first year as a head coach. But more importantly, I appreciated the help he gave me in my coaching career. He acted like I was one of his guys and made me so much better. He was one of my heroes, and I will be forever grateful to him. End quote. I could go on with another 20 quotes from coaches. I'm obviously not going to do that, but it speaks to, again, this fascinating dynamic with Knight. He's undeniably one of the best coaches, uh, coaching minds ever in the history of the sport, and his impression will last for decades to come. The motion offense isn't used as much now as it and isn't as influential now as it was when he adopted it and popularized it in the 70s, 80s, and 90s. Uh, but his coaching style and the way that he X and O'd has long been revered in the sport. And that influence obviously uh, is due a lot of discussion and a lot of praise. But his tactics and his way of going about doing it, and he was not, I want to be clear on this, Bob Knight was not... <sighs> He was not uh, the only coach that used these kind of tactics. This was a very popular way of coaching 
uh, people uh, decades before he started and even uh, in the years after he retired finally in 2008. We have moved on from that. But uh, I just don't believe that there's been any coach that has reached the highs that Bob Knight reached while also doing it in such ways that continually and of his own doing, his own hand brought on such scorn. Um, he is he is a one of one when it comes to this. There have been other coaches that have had plenty of success and drawn criticism. But with Knight, it was semi regular. And even in spite of that, I mean, you, you will have people across the board, legends in basketball at the college level, at the pro level, who will speak Knight's praises just for uh, what he accomplished. And then, you know, he just, he did contain multitudes, Parrish. I mean, he was willing uh, and wanting to help people. And I'm relaying stories I've read and heard over the years. I don't have any firsthand accounts of this, of course, but willing to... Uh, talk with many coaches uh, established and up and comers and, and, and players and, and people at, at many levels of the sport. And those impressions, they're long lasting for those people I gather because of the immense legacy and his celebrity. And for a lot of our listeners and viewers who are, I'm going to say under the age of 40, but certainly if you're 30 or younger, you have no frame of reference on what, uh, Bob Knight represented and how famous he got. Even me, as someone born in the early 80s, I can't even speak to you to how well known Bob Knight was. Where college basketball was in the American sports culture in the 70s and then specifically into the 80s when he coached the 84 Olympic team and he won two national championships in that decade, even after his 76 team went undefeated. Uh, you could make the case that Bob Knight was among the five most well-known coaches in all of American sports. And while that remained true in the decades to come, Mike Krzyzewski was certainly on that plane. Um, I think the impact and the week-to-week -week way in which that mattered reverberated more loudly in the 70s and 80s and 90s than I think maybe it has in the past 15 or so years. And so with that and with Bob Knight's passing, um, a lot of this is all just now landing at our feet to sit and reflect on who he was, the great things he did, the terrible th things he did, what they meant then, and how they will continue to be remembered in all sorts of ways in the years to come. Our friend Dan Wetzel had a nice column at Yahoo Sports and just, uh, uh, you know, shine a spotlight on, on the point you just made. Uh, Dan described Bob Knight in the 80s, uh, certainly the early 80s, as one of the most sought after corporate speakers in America because he had this message that if you were running a corporation it might resonate with you and your employees. It's all about, um, you know, uh, caring less about yourself than you care about the team. It's about attention to detail. It's about doing things a certain way consistently with discipline. And the, these are the are things that in, in, many walks of life, uh, people in managerial positions try to impress upon employees and corporations were quite literally hiring Bob Knight, uh, to come and, and speak to them. This basketball coach who they believed had things that uh, they could offer, he could offer that would, that would help uh, their corporation. Um, so I'll let other people determine whether the good outweighs the bad or the bad outweighs the good. But I do think it's important to stress that there was both good and bad. It, it, it both existed. Um, I'm, I'm glad, you know, you mentioned that he went back to assembly hall in February, 2020. And I went back and watched that earlier tonight and like, you know, got like a little, I, it was just sweet. It was just, and I'm glad he lived long enough to to be able to experience that because and i think this is true even of of bob knight and i didn't know him well you know i interviewed him i actually had dinner with him one night there's a funny story that uh comes yeah. out of that yeah and maybe that's an after the break story you've told it before <laughs> but i wondered if we were going to work our way to that on the show but even on that night though the end of the dinner was there was this funny moment um i just remember him not being warm even in this very casual setting amongst friends, I wasn't his friend, but he was with friends and I happened to be, I just remember him not 
really seeming to care. You know, like I, I just had dinner with a group of people over the weekend and I didn't know everybody real well, but like the people sitting directly across from me, I was like, oh, hey, I'm Gary. Hey, it's good to see you. Hey, so what do you do for a living? You know, whatever. We're just talking. They're like quite literally. I don't even think he even looked at me for an hour. Um, he just wasn't warm and he was often unnecessarily mean, just unnecessarily mean, intimidating in, in many ways. But I think even Bob Knight, even the person I just described has got to have something in there somewhere where having that moment at Assembly Hall in 2020, it had to mean something to him. And I know that he spent years insisting he doesn't care what anybody thinks. He doesn't care about Indiana. Quite literally said, when I die, bury me upside down so my critics can kiss my ass. Mm -hmm. All right. I just don't, I fundamentally don't believe almost anybody actually feels that way. Um, I think people, even people who say they don't care, I, I just usually don't believe them. That That's my experience in life. People do care, especially I think as they grow older and as they uh, approach the day that, that came for Bob Knight today. And so it didn't really matter much in my own life if he ever went back to Assembly Hall because you know, I'm not an Indiana fan. Um, you know, it, it, I'm just watching from a distance, but to go back and watch that, you could see what it meant to the people in that building. You could see what it meant to the men he coached. And yes, I think you could see what it meant to Bob Knight. I'm glad he lived long enough to where he could put, just push aside whatever resentment and anger and disappointment and hatred that might have been there for the way he thinks that school did him wrong. I was glad that he finally was able to push that to the side, walk out on that court and be appreciated by thousands of people who at one point in their life absolutely adored him. And many of them still did uh, to that day. I just thought it was, I thought it was sweet and I I'm glad that um, I'm glad that he and his family got to experience that. Yeah, I think that's an important postscript on all of this because in 2017, Bob Knight went on the Dan Patrick show and said some uh, some some pretty awful things about the people that were associated with getting him fired uh, at Indiana and saying he hoped they were all dead. And at this point in his life, he just had no desire to associate with Indiana at all. And night being the way that he was it was absolutely believable in the moment uh but i thought it was it was his lowest public moment after leaving the coaching profession maybe his lowest public moment since being fired from indiana and it did not reflect well on him um but credit to him and anyone else around him his family the indiana program that Three years, not even like two years later, I remember him going to an Indiana baseball game a couple of times. He was a, he was also a big baseball fan, a history buff, and again, just quietly showing up here and there. Not the basketball, but the baseball at first, and that led to in 2020, really on the precipice of COVID 19 hitting. We were just a couple of weeks out from the pandemic shutting everything down. Um, so for him to even have that opportunity then, in retrospect, is kind of interesting. Um, him getting that moment, and then. Yes, um, allowing some wounds to heal in a way that I think a lot of people thought would never happen. And I, again, I know it meant a lot to a lot of Indiana fans that he was able and the program was able to at least help with some of the fracture. I don't know if it was ever fully, fully repaired, to be honest, but enough of it was done. And at least the links that I think a lot of people thought never possible. Yeah. Um, if you get a second and you're interested um, go to YouTube and just Google Bob Knight returns to assembly hall. Like, you know, Pat walked him out, you know, that's his son. Um, it was just, the whole thing was a, a, a sweet moment. Cause obviously I think even at that point we were well aware Bob's health had declined. Um, and I don't want to say we knew the end was near, but it, it was becoming obvious that, you know, if he doesn't return to Assembly Hall soon, he might not ever return to Assembly Hall. And he and his family and those those fans will always have that. Um, and and I'm I'm 
you know, you, I, I'm, 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 I remember hearing that it was going to happen and being glad. Just like Nolan Richardson going back to Arkansas. Um, you know, we we've in, in sports these these people who accomplish incredible things and bring fans of of universities some of the greatest moments and memories. Um, they often get so sideways with these places, and the relationship is is just ugly and 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 and, and seemingly irreparable sometimes. But if you let enough time pass and you can focus on the good times rather than the bad, uh, I, I think everybody benefits from that. And I, I think that was a good day for Indiana basketball when Bob Knight was back inside Assembly Hall. I think everybody involved, if you didn't feel good about just that scene, take everything else, set it over here for a minute. Can we just have this moment together? I, I, I don't, I just, I know I keep going back to it, but I, I thought that was I'm glad that happened before this happened. I agree. I agree. I so do we need to tell the Bob Knight dinner story one last time? We we do. Um should we take a should we take a quick break before we uh before we get into the Bob Knight dinner story? Because I would say this is uh this maybe the third time you told it on the show, but you experienced Bob Knight in a way that uh that I think few others can claim. Okay, we'll take a quick break. Apologize if it seems inappropriate. It's a word from our partners. We need your sports news anywhere. We've got breaking news to bring you. Then get your sports anytime you want them. Big trade news overnight to discuss. Because we know you need sports all the time. A lot of movement in the rankings this week. A legend adds to their legacy. We're bringing you that breaking news right here on HQ. CBS Sports HQ anywhere, anytime, all the time. So we're in New York City. Champions Classic. Coach Knight has retired and he's now um, become a color commentator for ESPN. So we're thinking like 2011, 2012, 2013 and that. In that I way? could figure it out, I think, but I don't know off the top of my head. Okay. So I'm there and Jay Billis is there. And at some point, Jay says to me and somebody else we're sitting in the media room like banging out columns hey uh we're gonna get a late uh bite at uh carnegie if you know if you're free and you got nothing else to do i don't you know i don't i don't know how long you're gonna be writing i don't know what time your flight is tomorrow but if uh you know you want to join you're, you're welcome to join and at that point i don't think i really knew who was going it was i didn't ask too many questions it was just like hey jay and some people are going to carnegie and, uh, you know, late night mail and who doesn't like a late night mail? Sure. Uh, we'll go. So walk in, sit down. And when I say late night, I mean, it's after, I want to say it's after midnight. Cause it was well after the champions classic doubleheader. And, um, so you get there and it's, you know, table in the back, big table and it's Jay Billis. It's, I remember Barry Rorson slice was there. I want to say John Rothstein was there. I, this is this is before I worked with John, but I think John was there. Um, I'm not sure of everybody else, but Bob Knight also there. And when I get there, as I remember it, um, there's like not a lot of options of where to sit. And there's like one chair open. And I'm like, I, is this? And, hey, have a seat, GP, sit down. It's literally across from Bob Knight at the table. Like, like I'm here. He's right there. All right. And then like Jay's down here and slices over here and whatever. And you know how it is if you're at a, a dinner long table, like there's eight people or 12 people. Typically not everybody's talking to everybody. Like th these three people have their little conversation going. These four people have their little conversation going. And that's, that's the way this night is going. I am sitting three feet from Bob Knight. Our faces are, if, if I said, Bob, lean in as far as you can. And I leaned in as far as I could, we would headbutt each other. All right. That's where we were. I'm not exaggerating. I think for the first 45 minutes, he did not look at me. He did not acknowledge me. Uh, he did not say a single thing to me. You were thrown. You were, you didn't, you didn't know he had you in a box. He didn't know what to do. I just, I had never experienced that before. I, think about all the times I've sat down at a table in my life. I have never sat down directly across from somebody, sat there for an hour, and they not even look at me for an hour. 
Not no, even like I think a... I've sat down at a table with you before, and you've gone a good seven, eight minutes without acknowledgement. I think that's happened. <laughs> head, head and phone. I can remember a couple times that might have happened. So okay, I can empathize. So may, maybe I'm a modern day Bob Knight when you think about it. So it's 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 odd. I'm not saying it's rude as much as it's just noticeably odd. And I should be clear, he's not really talking to anybody. He's just he. The way I remember it, he is. He's in a conversation with kind of one person sitting next to him, and they are, this won't surprise you, they got a napkin out and a pin out, and they're drawing up plays, all right? They're, yes. they're doing basketball stuff on a napkin. And it's even like I'm, I'm observing this and really, like, appreciating it, but I'm not involved at all. It's, it's, it's like I'm Patrick Swayze in Ghost. I'm just, I'm here, and I don't understand excuse, why. No, excuse me. I think that's right, right? Wasn't Patrick Swayze a Ghost? He, he was. Uh, Nobody could see him. You know what? You're, Bruce you're, Willis not gonna, you're not going to find. You're not going to find that kind of analogy on any no. other basketball podcast. That's why we're proud to deliver yeah. you this show so often the way we. I do. feel invisible. That's the point I'm trying to make. I feel invisible. We order. I mean, appetizers uh, or, or sandwiches. The whole. Day. I mean, we've had our entire meal. All right. Still, this man who I have talked to before hasn't even looked at me. It doesn't even like nothing. And uh, so then it, we, it's time to order dessert. They come around. Hey, anybody want desserts? It's like, oh, I, I left a little room. <laughs> Give me a slice of that key lime pie, right? Everybody's ordering dessert. I'll have key lime pie. Somebody else is like, I'll have pecan pie. Somebody else is like, I'll have chocolate pie. Get to Coach Knight. The server gets to Coach Knight. And he says, um, I'll have a plate of bacon. And the lady was like, uh, plate of bacon coming up. And I was like, wow, two things. Now, I've never sat across from somebody at a dinner table for an hour without even being acknowledged. And I've never seen anybody order bacon for dessert. All right. Now, maybe this is a normal thing. But at this point in my life, I mean, I've seen a lot of people order a lot of desserts. I've never seen a plate of bacon, a dessert, like chocolate cake. That's a brownie, ice cream. You name it. This dude ordered a plate of bacon. All right. Still hadn't said a word to me, even looked at me. 10 minutes later, desserts come out. Here's the key lime pie. Here's the pecan pie. Here's your plate of bacon. She hands this guy a plate of bacon. He looks right at me and says, you want some bacon? And I'm like, what? In What is going on right now? First, first words all night. I mean, it was like he snapped and, and was like, he didn't say this, but this is what it felt like to me. GP, you want some bacon? That's what it felt like to me. He didn't say that, but that's what it felt like to me. Like, suddenly I'm in it. But here's the thing. I just ate a whole sandwich. And these sandwiches at Carnegie, boy, if you remember them, they're massive. Doesn't matter. I don't want bacon. I'm but, full. I just want one bite of my key lime pie yeah. and I'll be done with this. Yeah. And but, then we'll but now, one of the greatest coaches of all time, an icon, a man I grew up watching, is holding a plate of bacon in my face and offering it to me. So then I'm like, well, gee, I mean, if I say no, he throw a chair at me. I mean, I don't know what to do here. So I was like, uh, of course, uh, of course, Coach Knight, I, uh, thank you. I take a piece of bacon, start eating a piece of bacon. And then I have this moment where I go, is he just messing with me? Oh. Like, is this, is this his way of having fun? Bacon. Like, I'm not going to say a word to this dude for an hour. And then when the bacon gets, I'm going to, and then I'm going to hilariously order bacon for dessert and then ask him if he wants some. And he'll be so scared to say no, that he'll say yes. And I'll have this idiot eating bacon for dessert at two o'clock in the morning. I think it's the great social lubricator. You bring bacon into the fold and it's, it's just changing the temperature at the table. I think uh, that's the, the whole matter. thing changed. That's right. The whole thing changed. And I walked out of there going, man, I don't know what just happened. But that's going to be a story I can tell on a podcast six or seven times someday. I, I get the sense that wasn't your first thought when you walked out of there. But <laughs> but nonetheless, the old Bobby Knight bacon story. Yeah. Bacon for dessert. That's that's a heck of a move. It heck was strong. There. It was good bacon, if I remember correctly. My, oh, my. Well, it's... uh. Yeah, lose them right here a few days before the start of the season. Um, yeah, it's just it's just it's a big one. It's one of the biggest headlines of the sport of the of the year, to be honest. And um, you, you know, reactions will continue to unfold across the sport as the night goes on. If you're watching us live on YouTube, or if you're listening on Thursday morning, afternoon, evening, wherever, uh, they will continue. Uh, there was a moment of silence earlier this evening uh, prior to 
uh, in Indiana scrimmage, uh, I believe for women's basketball, people started to bring flowers and, and drop them just outside. And yeah, you'll hear some of the biggest voices in basketball reflecting on, uh, on Bob Knight, who I think the one thing we didn't mention earlier, two more things I wanted to mention one, um, this this evening's going by in a blur so i don't know if i mentioned her on the podcast i know i tweeted about it and i wrote it in my obit uh he identified michael jordan as the greatest basketball player he had ever seen in 1984 before jordan even played a minute with the chicago bulls he coached him on the olympic team um there are plenty of it, by the way out of H by the way some, i know some people might hear that younger people and go oh somebody thought michael jordan was the best uh, oh, oh, that, Nobody thought that at the time. No, nobody. And this guy who has the draft, this, this guy who was the, the giant of basketball said, this guy is the greatest basketball talent I've ever seen. You you can say, oh, well, of course, but like nobody else was saying that at that time. Jordan in 84 wasn't getting Wemby in 2023 hype, LeBron in 03 hype. Uh, he was considered good. He won national player of the year, was a top three NBA pick, but Knight was the first one to really go out there and say that. And uh, yeah, that no quote maybe is aged better for Knight than that one. And then he was someone, and this is again, what makes him interesting uh, among many other things, uh, high amounts of pride for graduating as players and everything that came with that like uh, the accountability which again like it can be a walking contradiction i mean he he wanted to hold his players to a high standard and yet uh, you know he was he was more liberal with profanity than any coach in public and private and uh couldn't resist bringing a bullwhip to a press conference or hucking a chair across the floor among even many other things there um but he uh, Indiana was never in the NCAA's crosshairs for cheating when he was there. It was just the behavior of a head coach that often got it into uh, into hot water there. Um, but yeah, we see the we see the tributes and quotes pouring in. Uh, it does speak to the winning he did, when he did it, how he did it. And if you have not read, and it's a long read. Uh, but I'm going to read it in the next 24 hours again. I've probably read the story like six or seven times in my life. In 1981, Frank DeFord, the late, great Frank DeFord, um, who I am thankful to this day that I had a chance to meet um, many, many years ago. But when I met him, I made sure to tell him uh, just how incredible I thought his profile on night was in 1981. It's called The Rabbit Hunter. And in it, you get... It is just a masterclass piece of sports writing and, and and human profiling about what made Knight great and flawed and ultimately foreshadowed his downfall at Indiana, which would come 19 years later. I mean, the true impact of a, a really amazing piece of storytelling and nonfiction journalism can be found when a writer touches upon a subject, has access to a subject, and... Um, you know, there's just a certain amount of clairvoyance in a piece that uh, that materializes years and years down the road. So um, if you're one for a good read and really want to take a transport back in time, and this is in the throes of, of night, you know, surrounding his second national championship with Isaiah Thomas on the roster, it's really, really good. And then, of course, Season on the Brink, the John Feinstein book in which uh, Knight allowed Feinstein to embed with him um, the season before they wound up winning the national championship is considered among the greatest college basketball books ever written. And somewhat ironic that Knight allowed Feinstein in and at a time when he Knight was adversarial with with plenty of, of journalists and media people. It was just it was part of the whole deal. But he let Feinstein in, and uh, from that came one of the better sports books that uh, that we've ever had. So, um, sad day in the sport. Um, Bob Knight, a true icon of college basketball, dead at the age of 83. And our thoughts are obviously um, with his family, including Pat, um, who played for him, succeeded him at Texas Tech. And, like, for every... Like I know Pat loved his father, um, but he was nothing or very little I like know. his father. Uh, like just one quick thing on me. That's Pat Knight, and I don't know him super well, but I've had a chance. You actually, I think, know him a little better than me. Um, fascinating guy on his own accord because of who his father was and and uh, and how Pat Knight came to be who he is and just different guy altogether. 
um, I look forward to hearing whenever Pat is comfortable and sharing even more stories and things about his father. Thoughts are with him and his family at this trying time. But uh, but there are many ways that uh, I uh, are many different versions of people that Pat Knight, I guess, could have evolved to be. And uh, the one that he became I th is just awesome, dude. And I only have amazing things to say about every interaction I've ever had with him. Yeah, like in, in the ways that Bob Knight could be intimidating um, or short or cold, like Pat's none of those things. He's just, uh, and I'm not trying to contrast father, son. I'm just oh. saying um, Pat lost his dad today. And that's, that's not an easy thing to deal with. And, um, you know, I've, I've, I've always uh, just had a real um, affection for Pat Knight. He's, he's smart. He's funny. Um, he's just a, he's a, he's a fun guy to be around. And so our, our thoughts are with him and, and everyone else in the, in the Knight family. I'm glad that they got to, I know it's a tough day, but um, again, the, uh, the announcement included that, that, that Bob passed while surrounded by his family. And uh, I'm, I'm glad they were able to share those, those last moments with their father. Um, thank you guys uh, for being here uh, for the Ion College Basketball Podcast. We did not plan to be here on Wednesday night, obviously. Remember, we've got another episode uh, coming on Thursday. We'll be live on CBS Sports Network for an hour at 10 a.m. Eastern on Thursday. And then that episode will upload to, to YouTube and to everywhere you get podcasts, including Spotify and, and Apple. So if you haven't subscribed yet, please go subscribe and check us out Thursday morning, 10 a.m. Eastern on CBS Sports Network. Till then, take care.